Today on Glove Affairs, let's talk about the gloves are off, the recent discussion about the greatest super middleweights. Okay, so uh, for those of you who don't know or like recent to the channel, every now and then as a jaded boxing fan, you're going to hear me get up there just because I need to talk about something that I like either heard, read, or everything, and just felt the need to voice the opinion, vent, or frankly bitch about. This here is one of those moments. I don't know how many fans out there saw the gloves are off the Sky Sports segment that was on the greatest super middleweights of all time. And you had Johnny Nelson, like, as the host, like, former Cruiserweight champion who was hosting it. At this table, you have Roy Jones, you have Joe Calzaki, you have Chris Eubank, you have Steve Callens, you have Richie Woodhull. At no point of this show, of this entire 45 minutes, can I first ask, did any of you hear a name that might have been mentioned in from that equation in your greatest super middleweights of all time? At no point at any time during this 45 minute telecast was Andre Ward's name even mentioned or brought up, not even in an honorable mention. They begin the show by saying Joe Kawasaki, when they introduced him, said the great, undoubtedly the greatest super middleweight of all time. Now, Kawasaki is a great middleweight and he definitely has his name in that discussion for a minute, regardless of what can be said about his career, regardless of what can be said about who he didn't fight or the ideas of um, his father, Enzo, his late father protecting him or any of that type of stuff. At the end of the day, he was the first undisputed super middleweight champion, 24 title defenses. You can't take that away from him. Having said that, I think that there's a very um, realistic amount of debate on the greatest super middleweight of all time. And I don't think that that's unanimously by him at all. And end result necessarily, when we look next to Ward's resume of opposition at the same. Beyond that, they go into the show and they speak about, they actually say, someone is missing, missing from this table. And they bring up Nigel Ben, who does rightfully belong to be at that table. They mentioned Michael Watson. They mentioned, uh, they mentioned Michael Watson. They mentioned somebody else I'm thinking of. Another super middleweight as well. At no point in the show was Ward even mentioned. This seemed too deliberate. Like, it seemed to be beyond coincidence for me. I mean, for those who don't understand, the irony of this too, which, bug, which, which probably bugged me more than anything else here, the irony of it is that this entire discussion at this round table consists of most of these guys starts off with Steve Collins arguing with Roy. And he's, you know, he's trying to figure out, oh, why did you duck me? And why didn't you give me the fight back in the day? And Roy said, listen, you work for a promoter who wasn't going to give me the stipulations. I wasn't going to be able to go overseas without being bound into the contract somehow. A lot of what we see even happen today. You see uh, Chris Eubank getting into it with him. I, I think that you were afraid of, of uh, uh, you know, you didn't think that you had the game plan to be able to take him. And him going back and forth and going, why didn't you fight Kawasaki? Well, you know, he was just coming up at the time. And I'm thinking what's crazy about it is that while all of them have very justifiable reasons, perhaps in their cases and their arguments, the irony of it is you have six people sitting at this table, six former world champions. Andre Ward would be the only one amongst them who never had the option of ducking the fight, of ducking the fights to begin with, because he earned his stripes in a super six middleweight tournament where every great fighter in it was uh, was contractually obligated to face every other fighter in that tournament. And he not only won, but extinguished it all the way out. I've long said that I always felt that part of the boxing media's frustration towards him and why Ward was painted in the negative light he was, is because in spite of being half white, he was too black for them and everything. And more so the fact that he beat a lot of the greatest super middleweights in the world and he beat a whole bunch of fighters in the it was let's be real about it everything it was more of a european demographic that was being pushed as the projected favorites in that super six so there was always some resentment towards that we saw that even later when he beat kovalev which should have been his rocky moment i talked about that on the previous segment of his career when they got up there and made every excuse in the world and it was robbery and american judges and this and that and the next fight it was a low blow and it was this and that but now he somehow doesn't even get mentioned think about the fact that richie woodhall who admittedly, and to his credit, said himself and everything that he didn't have a particularly great career, especially in comparison to the other um, fighters at this table. That Richie Woodhall is sitting there at this table, and Andre Ward was never mentioned. America's last male gold medalist, a fighter who's essentially 170 or so in O since his last loss at age 12. A fighter who retired unbeaten as the pound for rain and pound for pound champion and holding three of the four major light heavyweight titles. Something that none of the uh, 
outside of Roy at that table can say. How is he not mentioned at all? That being said, I did think that the discussion was very like enjoyable to see. I thought that like, you know, um, I thought that one thing that was interesting about it was that, I mean, that aside, was that like when Roy was talking about, he had a situation where like he was saying that since he lost his DQ, he lost his unbeaten record for Montel Griffin on the DQ. And since he knew that going out unbeaten was already out of the window, he had to make different goals to motivate himself. See, I always kind of assumed, and perhaps wrongfully so, that Jones moved up like solely because of the pressure of the networks. Because HBO was sitting there, unlike they do with Triple G and some fighters today, where they can sit there and there in that weight class and reign over that dominion and be defended, even for like, oh, he's just taking a mandatory fight. Jones was taking a whole lot of flack and heat for beat for dominating fighters and to the point where it was like, okay, we want to see you in a real fight. We want to see you in competition. We want to see you move up and wait. And I always personally thought that he bought into that to the point that he jumped all the way up to heavyweight, trying to prove that point and come back down. But it turns out that that may have not necessarily been the case. Because as he says here, after losing that DQ to Montel Griffin and knowing that going unbeaten was no longer in the, in the cards, he had to make new goals for himself. And his goal was to do something that hadn't been done over in, in over 100 years. And the goal he wanted to make to make his statement on the sport was to take was to go all the way up to heavyweight in the heavyweight title. Come all the way back down and went and recapture the light heavyweight title after going up, trying to do something Bob Simmons did over 106 years ago. So I thought that that was kind of like interesting to know. And I thought that like, you know, I mean, it was, you've seen Collins talk about the fact that, you know, I saw his frustration with not getting the fight. It was similar to what Mike McCallum was voicing towards the fab before. You know what I mean? So I felt like there was a lot of validity to like a lot of the arguments that took place. I thought it was crazy, you know, Eubank was sitting there, like, explaining to Callens. He was like, I don't think you were afraid, necessarily, of Kawasaki, but I think, like, you're a fox, and you have a game plan, you're a cagey fighter, and you couldn't find an answer, you didn't have an answer for how to outfox him, pretty much roundabout saying, so you decided to swerve that fight. Again, Ward is the one person sitting in this equation whose resume certainly isn't accounted on the aspect of ducking anyway. So... That being said, y'all tell me what y'all think. Hollow when you holler.